Hi, I'm Ben Furman. And I'm Nate Blayton. And this is Patch In, the show from SoundNotion.tv dedicated to the wonderful world of electroacoustic music. We're going to jump right ahead into some news, and then we've got guests and, of course, our famous two-minute explanation of some technical topic. So to start off with the news, some of you, like me, are probably NPR addicts, and you probably heard a couple of stories recently about the perfect pitch pill. Uh, essentially, some researchers have developed a pill that will help to reset your brain state to an idealized uh, teenage learning environment state where you can then uh, learn to acquire things like perfect pitch based on how the brain processes information and on how you can practice these skills. Uh, they do have the cat though that they recommend that you don't use it a lot and that permanently putting your brain into such a state might be a really bad idea. <laughs> Indeed. Um, another news uh, on the music notation software front, uh, Finale Update 2014A is here. Um, we've got different updates for Windows and Mac, uh, just a little bit of up differences in stability and some things with the layout. Uh, ben, you said you got this update, and it's been working okay for you so far? I did get this update. Um, it is working fine. I have not had any crashes. And the nice part is that uh, it is an automatic update. So as soon as you open up Finale 2014, it will say, hey, there's an update. Let me download and install it for you. So no more having to go figure out what your make music username is again and then remember that you don't have a password anymore for right, exactly. whatever reason. <laughs> uh, the next big news item that we have is that Eigen Labs, uh, the English company that makes the awesome electronic bassoon-looking Eigen Harp Alpha, is taking orders for new Eigen Harp Alphas. So if you've got about six grand burning a hole in your pocket, you can go online and put your name down for one of those. I would love to have one, but I'm poor. Alas, our little composer salaries don't quite <laughs> afford us those niceties. Um, however, we might be able to learn about some new, uh, some new things in the music production industry and everything. Uh, NAM, the National Association of uh, Music Merchants, they're having their annual conference. Uh, it's starting next week on Thursday and going through Sunday, January 27th. We're looking forward to some wonderful new products from that conference. And speaking of new products... Um, I've, <laughs> I, I'm kind of a fan of Akai hardware and everything, and I just got a new uh, sampler to add to my solar rig. It's the MPX-8. It's a, it's a little mobile sampler, and it's, a, it's amazing how far our samplers have come in the last 30 or so years. I, this is, it runs on USB power, plugging into an outlet in, in, either in your computer, and, and uh, it's got eight pads. You can control volume and pitch, and... Uh, and even it's got a little reverb digital effect built in, so it's, it's nice for that. But a kicker with this is that you can load samples through in a little SD slot. Um, yeah, <laughs> just thinking about uh, yeah, the, the old keyboards, like coming from Mellotron to the Emu, uh, different samplers, and then just it's come a long way to something in just a nice little box. Uh, yeah. Exciting stuff. I'm looking forward to trying this out. <laughs> okay. Well, that's about it for the news. So let's go on to the fun part. Uh, today, we are joined by not one, but two guests for the price of one. Uh, we have Paula Mathewson. She is a world-renowned composer. Uh, if you go to her website, paulamathewson.com, you will see all of her commissions and awards, which are way more than I could possibly say in our allotted time. Uh, she is a professor at Wesleyan University and is a composer of some really amazing uh, interactive and installation works. We are also, as a bonus, joined by Ron Quivilla, who is also a professor at Wesleyan University, another uh, composer of experimental and avant-garde and interactive works, and a student, I am told, of Alvin Lussier. So can't live it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, so they are sitting in a room. <laughs> Couldn't resist. I'm sorry. Inside joke, I guess. <laughs> or is it outside? <laughs> <laughs> now, 
Um, let's just start off with Seamus. Seamus is going to be at Wesleyan in 2014, which is this year now. <laughs> and it's coming up pretty fast. Yes, uh, so Seamus will be March 27th through the 29th here at Wesleyan. Um, it's going to be a um, big series of events, as it is usually. Um, and so we will have, over the course of those three days, uh, 15 concerts. So it'll be a big, you know, full-on experience again of uh, electroacoustic music, um, series of papers as well. Um, in addition to that, we'll have a number of sound installations and a series of sort of uh, collaborative projects that we're really excited about. Um, that is sort of our sort of spin on uh, these sort of... Uh, uh, festivals and conferences, which is through the uh, open window, which will have sort of three segments to it. One, which is uh, the non-aggressive music deterrent. Um, another, which is a uh, sort of a version of Rainforest, uh, where you bring your own object, and we'll uh, be sort of spatializing through that. Um, as well as um, Rock's Roll after Rio Anji, which is a project that Ron's uh, developed. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I should say also there will be a pre-conference event, which is a talk by Georgina Bourne, who did uh, an ethnology of IRCOM as her first uh, uh, work and recently published this anthology called Music Sound in Space. Mm -hmm. And uh, that will be the night before. And Brian Kane, whose book on um, acousmatic music is coming out in June, and if you look at he has these brilliant articles on acousmatic music out already, will be a respondent, will be a general conversation. And part of the goal, we're hoping that uh, Seamus participants will come to this because her basic argument is that in music, we tend to think of space in predominantly either acoustic terms, spatialization, or pitch space, and we occlude and don't really think about social terms. And as you can appreciate, because of all of what's happened with digitization, how we're doing this right now, there's a very, very complicated kind of transformation of the topologies of music that's taken place. And it's a great site for compositional endeavor. So the Open Window Project, part of the idea here is to respond to that challenge that she gives in the introduction of that anthology uh, in a very direct terms by doing these projects that um, uh, we've done before. For example, the Non-Aggressive Music Deterrent mm -hmm. uh, first organized a version of that. Gee, I think it was about 2005. Uh, the idea there is it's the, it's based, that's uh, Jonathan Stern's term for this business of using Muzak in public spaces to deter certain kinds of users. So in this particular it's, case, there's a big parking garage down right off Main Street in Middletown where they play like classical Muzak all the time. They insist it's to make it that it's comfortable for people who use the parking garage. Mm -hmm. But it also seems to be there to deter the skateboarders, or at least that's my feeling. <laughs> uh, so the idea is for people to compose pieces or uh, compose program material in relation to that site. So mm -hmm. what's happening at that point is it's not that you're composing a piece for the black box or for the abstraction of an eight-channel surround, but rather for a very particular social space. So what you do there means like, okay, so we can go back and think about Trevor Wishart and this idea of landscape and music, whether you allow referentiality into the sounds you work with mm. in, in an electroacoustic piece. You know, this is an old debate, you know, and we can all, you know, take a moment and, and think of, you know, Prescarian and other great pieces that open this up or go much, back much further to 433 or to Max Newhouse for other, other versions of that. Um, so the idea here is that that then becomes a framework, a situation, which is not a normal situation at Seamus Conference, yet it's completely congruent with the preoccupations of Seamus. Yeah. Now uh, that opens up some very interesting questions in terms of if you're composing for a space that has some sort of, uh, let's go with the term, passive-aggressive uh, musical deterrent in there already, do you want to play off of the inherent nature of that and up the level of musical aggression to complement what's going on there already? Or would you compositionally want to contrast that to make it something that might appeal to uh, the skateboarding crowd? Yeah, yeah, well, remember, we're replacing the sound design that's there. So we take over right. the sound system. So it's it's completely the choice of people conceiving of their project, what, you know, what kind of tactical relationship they're going to take. Mm -hmm. For example, when we first did it, this was early days of mobile phones. And so we had, you know, one group of students. And basically, all they wanted to do is make people reach in their pocket thinking their phone had dropped. 
<laughs> just you know, you know, just silly, but but funny, and within the context of a twenty-four hour continuity, is kind of a great moment. Um, yeah. You know, I really wanted to just have, you know, a muezzin uh, 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 calling the Koran on Sunday morning in the quaint little New England town. <laughs> and particularly at that moment, which is right in the middle of the Iraq adventure, it has lots of different resonance. So that that's kind of part of what happens when you locate uh, sounds mm -hmm. in these funny public-private spaces, which is very different from what happens in a concert. Right. And that actually kind of recalls to me at least uh, some of the early experiments that uh, Schaefer and Henri were doing over in Paris in terms of what is the nature of a sound. And when you have it recorded, what are you really hearing? Are you contextualizing it based on your prior information of the sound or are you reinterpreting it in the context of the location of if it's in the black box or if it's nowadays in the concert hall? Does that elevate it to the level of art as opposed to just some background yeah, and so so getting back to Georgina Bourne in a sense, this uh, so reduced listening. Well, what happens now, of course, is we are constantly code switching. Musicians are yeah. constantly code switching. So there's no stability in those terms. Uh, we move back and forth. But, of course, the canonical versions of this work, as emerged in the 50s and 60s, code switching wasn't... Uh, uh, central to it because media hadn't kind of processed into completely invading every minute of your daily existence as mm -hmm. it is now. And so that becomes the question and the challenge and the problem for us as composers to think about, well, okay, um, how do I respond to that? Is the concert the only format I should be working in? How can I respond to these challenges? So that's kind of, the non aggressive music tutorial gives one version, one question of that. Rock's role after Riolanji was this project I did um, for the Buddhism project in New York. They asked me to conceive some kind of show in relation to the influence of Cage's interest in Buddhism on the arts or on music. And it's like, well, that's either you know, too broad or too narrow. <laughs> Very hard to do. Oh, yeah. So, so what I thought was, well, no, what I'm going to do is take this one thing. First of all, Riolanji, the piece, the series of pieces he did are quite beautiful. And they have this very interesting idea of basically separating the articulation of time with that irregular pulse from uh, sound artifacts that, you know, that are essentially glissandi on instruments, untempered glissandi on instruments. Mm -hmm. So there's, in a sense, continuous if you actually play that piece, it's wonderful because if you're playing a glissando against that impulse, irregular impulse, you are immediately completely lost. You have no idea of where you are in time. You have no idea of where you are in pitch because you're at some untempered intermediate space. And you're just lost, right? And that that is, of course, exactly the goal of that music is to put you into a completely innocent state in relation to... Uh, listening to music, it does it really well. I mean, for the performer, as well as for the listener. Um, so the thought was to sort of abstract and generalize that to some kind of articulation of time and sounds that are conceived of as a continuous individual event and that are open to being overlapped with others. So the important thing here in this is that this is an exhibition of sound works intended to be overlapped with other sound works. Mm. I mean, that that is the, so the central thing here is to say, hold on, we're always whining if you're doing installations about the leakage from the other piece, right? You're always worried about that. So no, 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 no. In this context, you have to be embracing that. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's embraced in a Cajun fashion. There'd be other ways of thinking about that, but that that's the central um, uh, issue. In the first show, uh, uh, Bernard Gall did this brilliant thing. He sent a recording of uh, this French billiards without pockets, just playing okay. billiards. And that was used as the articulation of time. Interestingly, I got very few good submissions for the articulation of time, but that one was brilliant. <laughs> this time, because we're in Middletown, Connecticut, where half the population comes from Sicily, we're going to record it and do a studio recording of playing bocce. Nice. <laughs> to do the same thing. Uh, and then there'll, there'll be the, the contributions. 
And so part of that too was for the call for works for that was also very intriguing and in that, you know, it was calling for these sort of co collaborating overlapping projects. And so uh, through that, there was sort of this idea of submitting in sort of different kind of categorizations with that as either being sand or being rocks. In this case, one being sort of more that sort of continuous articulation of time and one being more discrete. And so... Yeah, the rocks are the individual events. So, so Cage's idea was that the, the Basandi, that the uh, performers play in Ryoanji were analogous to the 15 stones in the Ryoanji garden. And so for that, this will be on the lower level of the World Music Hall, um, and so there will be 15 loudspeakers there, and yeah. Yeah, the, and so the loudspeakers will be arranged sort of in the manner of the Rio Angie Garden, um, uh, you know, with, with this sort of grouping of three, five, and so forth. And they sit on a bed, not of sand, but of uh, uh, those star uh, uh, cornstarch packing peanuts. Because oh, it's a gosh. great sound absorber, <laughs> and it's the perfect, you know, kind of irony, and it's relatively cheap. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <right>. And it's edible. <laughs> right. And it's all yes. So here's right. Environmentally a, friendly a is always a plus. Pitch. No, no, a quick pitch. Yeah. I have wanted to do a project somewhere with a large reverberant space that we could fill with plastic peanuts and then slowly have water dripping so that they gradually <laughs> dissolve. So it goes from being completely dry acoustic back to the wet acoustic over time. There was a space actually in Padua, which was used for modeling um, uh, the Venice um, uh, 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 whole water area. Mm -hmm. It's huge, which I was trying to get the, uh, such a project to happen, but could never get the funding. So, you know, if anybody has a swimming pool and a little <laughs> money, let's do it. <laughs> Oh, unfortunately, I have neither. Otherwise, I would be very much up for doing those. Um, <laughs> now I'm, I'm especially I'm interested in the idea of uh, sound and how it kind of traverses through different media other than the air. And to do that with dissolving packing materials could be really entertaining. <laughs> and, and actually, that theme gets us back to the Rainforest Project, mm -hmm. which is so... Uh, if you don't, I mean, some people won't know about, so the idea of rainforest is to take, um, to make a choir of loudspeakers where each loudspeaker, instead of having flat frequency response, has a, its own character. Its own characteristic sound. So it's kind of like a filter. And of course, the way these were done was originally with found objects. Mm -hmm. Then it evolved to sort of compound objects that are kind of assembled for their acoustic characteristics. And the classic version that one knows of is rainforest four which is a kind of immersive environment with many performers. And one of the things that's very interesting about that piece in relation to this theme of like, well, the social properties of space and music is when you actually go to a Rainforest 4, it has a natural evolution from science fair to cocktail party to concert. Because people come in, they're wandering around, they're looking at the objects, performers are generally there, and inevitably questions are asked. So that's sort of the science fair part. Well, why this? What is it doing? Dot, dot, dot. Then audience wandering around, they inevitably see somebody they know and it becomes a cocktail party. Oh, hi, how are you doing? What did you think of this? Dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. Then at some point, all of that kind of combination of tr a social transaction and aggression gets satisfied. People are kind of done. And at that moment of relaxation, that's when the concert can kind of begin. And the idea of a flow of that sort that's based on a very, you know, ambiguous social transaction with a particular group of people that happen to be there, I think is really a very uh, powerful alternate to the concert form as we know it, which is essentially there's a certain level of repressed violence of you will be quiet and you will be in this darkened space and I will now address you. That yeah. instead it's transactional. Um, uh, and so that that is a, a very interesting property of that piece. Now, the problem is, if you try to do that piece with many performers, you have to really understand what the dynamics are to get it right. You actually have to rehearse, you have to perform it a few times to really do it. And mm -hmm. so that's not really possible when you've got 15 concerts in three days. You don't have the time to rehearse. But there's an earlier version of the piece, so there are many versions of Rainforest, actually, where... What he suggests is limiting it to a small number of sounds, two sounds, no more, diffused through the objects. So the idea is transformation happens by where, what speaker you go to. 
Mm-hmm. And so the thought here is to do that version and have many people make diffusions. And so those are performances that happen. And then we record those diffusions, they can run as an installation as well. With the goal being in part to just let all the Seamus membership kind of experience what, you know, what's going on with this piece. It happens, um, some of the original composers inside Electronics, John Driscoll and Phil Edelstein, have been um, redoing the piece and actually making a new version they call Rainforest 5. And okay. so uh, part of the goal here for me is the hope that this will interest people in the Seamus membership into interacting with John and Phil and possibly doing a classic Rainforest 4 or this Rainforest 5 elsewhere as they try to redevelop and maintain the piece. Because mm-hmm. there's a way in which while the, ele- the technological substrate is quite clear, there is quite an oral tradition in how you go about performing it, like how that really works, how that social transaction works, how you, I mean, even like little things about how you set up the objects and that really, if you like the objects, the piece will work better. You know, yes. that, that having the little bit of theatrical presence mm-hmm. really helps stabilize people. All of those kinds of things emerge when you actually make the piece. So yep. that's the third of these open window projects. Part of what's transformative about it, too, I think, is that sort of question of, like, I think in electroacoustic communities, like, we're used to sort of developing our own sounds, our own programs, potentially, but a lot of times the element that gets taken for granted or not questioned necessarily is uh, the speakers outside of maybe sort of general sort of issues related to placement to sort of have this kind of a perfect... Yes acoustical sort of space from which, you know, the sort of perfect area of reception is maybe someplace in the center. But in this case, when you decentralize that, it opens up so much more to these sort of social kind of uh, aspects that Ron's talking about. And right. like, and part of what's transformative about it, though, too, is that when you sort of build your own sort of output sort of device, like this course of speakers, it's one of many, but then you also get, it, it truly invites this different way of listening in a way that I find, um, yeah. Now, that actually uh, brings up a question that I had for you, Paula. Uh, you've worked fairly extensively with interactive and installation works. So how does your work within those two domains sort of influence the setup for uh, Rainforest and how you're approaching the conference? Um, well, for my, for, sorry, for my own work in terms of how that, how that influences the setup for Rainforest? Yeah. Are you drawing upon that in any way for this setup, or are you approaching this as a totally different project? Well, like there's, I mean, some of the concerns definitely overlap for me, but I think that they feel fairly independent to me. Um, okay. Because it reinforces its sort of own kind of body in a way, like it's right. its own kind of has its own genesis. Whereas for an installation or an interactive work, I'm usually sort of considering sort of you know other others sort of more specific areas of what, you know, the nature of exploration is, who I'm working for, what the space is, and things like that. Um, but certainly at a very broad level, those things sort of uh, um, overlap, but Rainforest really is its own thing. <laughs> gotcha. Well, and it, but it is interesting to think about a taxonomy of different approaches to, you know, sort of multiple diffusion of sound in space, right? That, so there's the set of approaches that are about creating a virtual sound space, so wave field synthesis, or even, you know, octophonic array. And there's a sense in which in those approaches, there's a way in which the ideal might be a cinema, a completely dry acoustic, because then you have complete control over the sound field, you can shape it, and, and you're, you're fine. Then there's a whole set of approaches that involve interacting with the existing acoustic. So uh, years ago, Alvise Vidolin and Nicola Bernardini, uh, I think they actually wrote this article, or at least they were talking about it, which was what you can actually do with eight-channel diffusion in opera halls. So they, you know, uh, uh, Alvise was, uh, actually at one point he was Nono's um, tone meister, and, he, and both were working for Berio. And so they had this experience of doing these pieces repeatedly in these halls. And so there's a question of, well, what, what actually works when you're in that right. space? So that, that's one approach, which is completely different from what the ideal would be. Then there's kind of a very true axe model, which is, you know, it's partially granular synthesis, partially based on soundscape, that in fact, what actually matters is not the accuracy of the image, mm-hmm. but rather a sense of envelopment and a kind of phase decorrelation. You know, that it, it becomes much more like a natural sound space. 
-hmm. And you know, I would say for myself, it is. I find that it's often the case for multi-channel diffusion. It's much you get much more interesting results if you take eight speakers, put them in a cluster facing all directions, in particular up. Mm -hmm. If what you're after is using the space to transform the sound a little bit like the rainforest objects transform the sound, that's how you actually will get the largest variety out of the space. So mm -hmm. when we were planning this, I was joking, we were joking around about, uh, it's just not practical to do at this point, it would be, but it would be great to have completely different speaker configurations for each concert. <laughs> And my, and my thought was, oh, no, we'll have a concert where we have eight channels, but there would be eight mono pieces, one for each speaker <laughs> oh, in man. a circle. You know, so for every combination yes. of speakers, there'd be a unique piece. And that, you know, but you think about it, and opening up the terrain that way, it immediately gives you ideas. It's like, yeah, well, yeah, what the heck would the piece be if it's just for my left ear? <laughs> and how can I make it that people don't turn? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah, I just finished reading uh, Nick Collins' book on computer music, and he goes into a lot of that. And so does uh, uh, Simon Emerson and Leigh Landy in their uh, recent books as well. Um, and it's an interesting thought exercise that I've always wanted to uh, try as well, but have never had uh, the resources or the guts to really <laughs> try and realize at all. Yeah. But yeah, that sounds like the conference is going to be absolutely amazing. And I, yeah, we're looking yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, w I was wondering with all the with all the planning coordination, yeah, working on details, speaker array for each uh, for each of the concerts. I was wondering um, if you, if either you are having your own compositions featured in any of the concerts, or we don't dare. No. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there's this thing of where you have to decide that the conference is the meta piece. You know, I mean, because if you do. It's just too much of a distraction. It's like moving yeah. between zones of abstraction. Right. We do lots of code switching, but when you know you've got 130 <laughs> things to think about, maybe yeah. that's enough. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I guess that uh, leads into. Uh, I was wondering, like, what each of you are working on right now. I I know each of you have done a lot of work with recorded media and working with different kinds of. I know, Paula, you've worked with dancers and doing uh, different media installations. Do you have any projects that you're working on right now? Or? Um, I just finished a piece, um, two, two sort of large pieces that I did. Um, one was I did a piece for Nina Dehene, who's this um, amazing uh, double bass player and improviser um, in, uh, uh, in Sweden. And so I was um, doing part of this festival, Sounds of Stockholm. And so that was um, really sort of this, uh, you know, is in this sort of uh, very, this beautiful space called Audiorama, which had, you know, just numerous speakers and sort of that kind of configuration of ascending sort of circles. Mm -hmm. um, and she's such an incredible improviser, um, really does sort of really beautiful percussive work and extended techniques on her instrument. And so um, we had this back and forth where she was sending me a lot of material and then I sort of was working with, uh, playing with it and improvising with it as well and sort of multi-channel array. And that's sort of how I have my system set up. Uh, for improvising. Um, but then I also kind of, you know, with rehearsal time being uh, so limited and things like that too, I kind of wanted to think a little bit more about um, how to sort of destabilize things in terms of the relationship be of the performer to sort of the tape part um, that we think about a lot. And so, um, so I was performing with her, but also like part of what I was trying to do was um, play with feedback um, simply by transducing some of the audio and her audio through uh, two different tam-tams so that they become, it's this question of sort of her being as a performer on an instrument being the source of vibration, but then um, also um, of acoustical vibration, uh, but then also when, you know, not having particularly loud and dramatic stage presence myself, um, you know, my sort of sort of sounds coming from this sort of very, uh, you know, sort of circle, I kind of wanted to have that sort of intermediary between that. So part of what I did was sort of take that audio and then sort of, you know, run it through these two tam-tams and then that sort of becomes this way of, you know, taking the audio, treating it sort of as kind of a way of generating sort of some sort of funky reverb, uh, but then also um, sort of playing with that sort of uh, sense of where sounds are coming from in space. Um, That's interesting. So um, do you mean that you would have a microphone on the bass clarinet, but then feeding into a transducer on the tam-tam itself? 
Um, yes, I mean, this is also drawn from Tudor. And in fact, I borrowed some of the star drivers from the studio. <laughs> 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 and, uh, um, but so then, yeah, so it's really just sort of um, then, you know, so then I can take sort of the kind of more, because there are some sort of fixed parts in there that I, I had to use. And then so taking that as well as her live signal, running that through um, the Tam Tam. So those are vibrating um, and transferring their own sort of acoustical energy that way. But then also then having microphones attached to the tam-tams as well so that I'm picking up the sounds as they're feeding through that and then just running those through the loudspeakers. But it also becomes an interesting way of generating feedback. And so that was also yeah. part of like, playing with that volatility was something that um, I was interested in. Yeah, I can yeah. only imagine uh, how the tam-tam would affect the sound that's coming into it through the transducer. But then also when you set that up in a feedback loop, that's got to be pretty spectacular. Yeah. We were just talking about using uh, different speakers as an instrument to affect different audio and everything. And <laughs> thinking of using an object is so sonically rich as a tam tam. That's yeah. That must. That's a that's a brilliant idea. Um, have you ever used uh, that idea, either of you, of uh, running audio through different objects, like really non-traditional speaker setups? Or? Well, that's rainforest. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That yeah. Is, okay. That's that's what it is. So, okay. And and yeah, of course. I mean, that's something that. It's sort of like working with delay. You just can't resist it. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you've got your Nantara piece, your delay piece, your rainforest piece. You just have to do them, right? Yeah. It's right. System. Uh, oh, so I'm going to be doing a concert in late, in late April, and I'm kind of working up a whole new program in relation to that that draws on a couple of pieces I've been doing over the last couple of years. Um, one is returning to an idea I had a, a few years ago, which is about, uh, okay, the idea of sound material that you know, but everybody knows something different. So a classic example, the experience of this that, that struck was, remember being in Italy trying to use a payphone and thinking it was broken because the dial tone in Italy pulses. It's the only country in the world where it, it pulses. Really? So I then looked up and found, you can always find something on the web, uh, enumeration of the dial tones, ringtones, and busy signals of all the world's phone systems. Mm -hmm. And use that as motivic material, making a piece, so that this idea that, and you hear this and it sounds like, oh, okay, it's beep, beep, but then, boy, you hear a dial tone, you know you're in your yeah. dial tone, you're back in your own programming. And uh, then there's a related idea about, and this has to do with this whole, you know, one way of putting it is the kind of the, the fractalization of public and private that happens when you're on your phone, and so you're talking out there, but you're talking intimately, but you're in this space. Right. All of that, that, that strange combination. So it's kind of exercise piece for multiple performers where they each try to tell a story, but the rule is they have to follow the other stories being told. And if you begin to tell a story and somebody else doesn't follow, then you fall silent. If you stop being able to follow the other stories, you fall silent. So you have these slowly emerging little clusters of narrative that then fall down and then start up again and fall down. And so I'm going to give each performer sort of a set of things to draw upon for their story. They can add their own material, but there's things that need to come through. And the idea is it's a little bit like a dinner party that it doesn't matter when this happens, but it needs to happen. Like everybody has to enjoy themselves. At yeah. least some <laughs> Eventually, but, uh, you have to eat. Yes. Yeah. So, so this happens as another process, and then the third process is I'm very interested in uh, masking. Okay, critical bands, and mm. I did this project uh, where I I wrote a little program. Oh, here's the super collider plug, right? A little program yeah. okay. to look at and and work out differing. Uh, combinations of, of bark intervals. Okay, so, so, yeah. you know, so sort of static representation of critical bands. So the rule is that any one sound has at least two critical bands to itself relative to any other sound happening in the piece. And it, it's really interesting the numbers you get, depending on how many critical bands you use or how many you need to have distinct, you get these different uh, you know, kind of subdivisions of the soundscape. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that there are these differing elements that will come in 
and essentially render communication impossible by occupying, say, you know, if, if, if you've got between one and four kilohertz occupied, okay, no constant goes recognized. So it's like communication is over. So then these other sound materials can gate that other process. So the, what I'm after in the piece is that it will keep on shifting attention, shifting its focus, if you will, but that all the foci are always co-present. Okay? Okay. And what I'm trying to get... Well, just to different degrees in terms of what the listener is actually experiencing. Yeah, exactly. Where, yeah. where the emphasis is at any one moment right. that keeps on changing. And so, and, and so it's a little bit of, of trying to imagine a, a, almost a piece that's kind of a portrait of what we all do all the time and listen. Right. How we normally filter out background noise in a conversation or if we're on our cell phones and are focusing in on that or focusing in on what someone across the room is saying on theirs. Exactly. And, and then, so for example, actually in an installation version of the phone piece, I put half the material in the telephone receiver and the other half in the room. So you have to listen to both to hear the piece, right? I mean, so wow. these ways in which you mess with the topology of your standard auditory practice. And of course, it will take people, it can take people a long time to recognize, oh no, this is only half the piece. That's part of the piece too. And that idea where you you set up a situation where you're listening, you have to change your understanding of your listening. So you have to open to this thing that before you were shutting out. That's something I'm very interested in, which I see, I mean, one thing is you, you of course, it's a long story. There's lots and lots of pieces that have done that in different ways over the years, certainly in the post-war period. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, it, it, there's a way in which it has a certain, um, almost like a moral, there's a moral to the story, right? That the moment you do that as a listener, you've, you've enacted um, losing a wall, losing a barrier just in your own hearing. Right. And that to me is, it, it, that makes more sense to me as something to have music do than an expression of my own inner emotion. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I mean, that, that we need more of that. Yeah. <laughs> and we need less of the expression of the inner emotion. Right. Now, this is. As a whole. So that's kind of where, where that project's at. Right. Now, this is somewhat tangential. Uh, to that, but um, in both of your cases, how has this idea of changing your understanding of listening affected your compositional practice in both electronic and acoustic works? In every possible way. <laughs> <laughs> that's so huge. I mean, that, well, specific, is there anything in specific that comes to mind? Like, uh, instead of focusing on uh, pitch aspects, you now focus on rhythmic aspects or in terms of uh, moving beyond just the uh, the frequency domain or the pitch domain and into time or even spectralization. Do you see any way that stands out in general? Oh, well, I mean, I mean, this whole thing of masking. Yes. So, right. I, I mean, I, I mean, absolutely. It's so that to think of a sound as occluding or being transparent, and that that being its predominant significance. Mm-hmm. I think, it, you know, in fact, I've, there's a piece I've never done, which I, I want to kind of get to when I have time, right? Which is I, I want to look really closely at, you know, I don't know, maybe Octandra, some Verez piece, and analyze it in terms of masking. Because the idea of interpenetration of sound masses... Okay. Now the thing about it is, there's so much else going on because of the rhythmic gestures and these other right. uh, things, and and actually the chords are you know not done that way at all. But I suspect the orchestration might be, and that the, the, so there could be an interesting piece to be done that's a shadow, just the shadow of the masking relationships mm-hmm. in a res piece as as a way of understanding that. So for me, that is very that's one that's very interesting. Maybe another is uh, these passages between physicality and abstraction in your hearing of the sound. Like, look, why do you use all these speakers? It's to make these fundamentally abstract electronic sounds have physical presence, right? I mean, that's, that's what it gives you when you do that. And I think there's, that becomes another. So, for example, classic move is 
you've got some sound dancing around, and then you make it kind of spitty and impulsy and located in one little loudspeaker. Right. And right. suddenly you've moved from hearing the sound out in the space to hearing that loudspeaker. So that's a kind of logic of evolution in the piece, which is not one that you get to, I think, until you've had the experience of, of making, of, among other things, making sound in a big room. Mm-hmm. You know, to have that actually matter that, oh, that speaker is 30 feet away, and, it's like, and you're aware it's that speaker. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that those kinds of relationships are, I think, things that, cut, that emerge and that you discover once you've got that reorientation. And like with modes of listening and things like that too, they're so contextually based, right? That I think a lot yes. of those issues of sort of, um, when we get down to the nitty gritty of sort of like pitch rhythm and sort of relationships like that, a lot of times I think that can be so much more informed by these sort of broader issues of sort of just uh, basic context. And so I think like with the sort of, um, uh, the issue sort of rainforest, like if you light it, uh, then that actually changes the sort of experiential quality as well um, in terms of going in and perceiving the space. Um, and then for like for my own work with the work divided by time sound installation, like part of what I liked about it was that um, it was not only that you heard all these different discrete sounds coming from different locations, but you also would have the heat and the smell of so many candles uh, burning in the room. And then that was like a way of sort of articulating sort of the space differently when you stepped in, that it would smell and feel palpably different than yeah, um, yeah. anything from the outside. And this is sort of the moment for the, for the standard Wesleyan world music plug, which is, <laughs> of course, in in the world's musics, this mm-hmm. division that we, you know, have inherited and to right. some degree maintain, uh, which, you know, maybe it's a 19th century business, you know, like Friedrich Kittler would say, you know, it's like, you know, film photograph typewriter, this division, the breaking apart of sensation into these separate media streams. Mm-hmm. You know, that's simply not a part of how many performing arts are conceived throughout the world. And it's not really obvious that it's to our benefit particularly as composers now doing this wacky electroacoustic stuff within a world that, you know, isn't paying that much attention, right? That, yes. that, we, that we need to be thinking about, well, no, 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 how is the world organizing itself and how can we interpolate what we do into that? And so that that's, a, you know, again, this movement away from the black box and out into the big bad world, but out of the big bad world understood as creating all these different little funny possible spaces for a musical intervention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I absolutely love that term, musical <laughs> intervention. Um, <laughs> man, yeah. I'm going to be using that for a long yeah. time now. It's trademarked. So, right, uh, it's trademarked. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> no, my special term that, that, that got popular at one point was sound is a sloppy signifier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you know, Foley, right? I mean, so... Yeah. That that's part of the pleasure of sound is you're always confusing it. So, you know, what is tonality but a long series of puns? <laughs> <laughs> well, I could make I several can... very bad jokes about that right now, but <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, the... I can't. Um, yeah. yeah, Paul but... and Ron, thank you so much for, for doing, coming on the show and doing this interview with us. It's been really mind-opening, and I can't wait to... Uh, I hope to attend Seamus conference and uh, Ron. That yes. yeah, that other conference or the concert that you said that you had coming up in in a couple months or something. When was that? Or oh, roulette. Um, that's I can't remember the date. Oh, it's a s- Sunday late in roulette. Uh, late in April. Okay, that's, cool. That's Seamus. Okay, cool. It's well, like we'll, the twenty fifth or twenty seventh or 27th. something. Twenty seventh. Okay. Well, we'll keep an eye out for that. Paula well. is organized. Okay. I'm prepared. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're just the talent. You don't have to worry about details <laughs> like that. <laughs> well, thanks again so much. <laughs> yeah. And Paula, do you have anything else coming up that you want to uh, plug in the air? Yeah. So, um, well, I'll be doing a show at CMAS uh, in, uh, in Morelia um, with uh, fabulous bassoonist uh, Dana Jessen. Um, and so that will actually be the sort of uh, uh, right before Seamus, the two weeks before. Um, so that's cool. the last gasp before going fully in. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then I'm, I'm working with the Italian guitarist, um, Alessandro Nobaga, who's an incredible improviser. And um, she'll be uh, premiering a new work that I wrote for her uh, fairly soon. Um, but, uh, um, well, in Europe. So, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wonderful. 
Well, if we have any European viewers, uh, that would be something to check out. Unfortunately, I am kind of confined to the States. (laughs) For the most part, yeah. Um, Well, yeah, Ron and Paul, thank you again so much. Uh, We're going to go on to our next segment of the show, and (laughs) I I hope you've been enjoying the past uh, versions of this. But in this month's two-minute challenge, Ben will attempt to explain audio filters in 120 seconds or less. Ben, how are you feeling up to it? I'm feeling up to it, but uh, just a reminder, this is going to be a very, very basic overview of filters. So, well, Wonderful. Well, uh, Ben, whenever you're ready, uh, <laughs> Dave, if we could get the clock ready, awesome. Go for it. Okay. Is the clock ready? All right. Pasta oh. is delicious. But uh, getting pasta out of boiling water is painful. Fortunately, there is this. It's a colander. Basically, you dump your pasta and your boiling water in there. It keeps the pasta inside, and you don't burn your hands. It is a filter. And in audio, filters are very similar to that. In the strictest sense, filters are sound processors that affect different frequency components of a sound in different ways, such as cutting out the highs, bumping up the lows, or just leveling out the mids. All filters function in a very similar way. You set a cutoff frequency, which is where the filter will begin to act. And then you set a roll-off factor, also called the Q value, that tells the filter how aggressively to behave. So say we want to uh, use a really aggressive Q value, then the roll-off is essentially going to be theoretically vertical. Anything that is on the side we don't want gets cut out. In reality, this doesn't really happen because it is, in fact, closer to the colander. Every once in a while when you're straining pasta, some noodles will go through. And filtering audio is the same way. Occasionally, upper or lower harmonics will go through. You might get a fundamental you're trying to cut out. It happens. Uh, Generally speaking, though, the higher the roll-off, the more aggressive it is. And you can even overdrive this roll-off so that you'll boost and create a little bit of uh, nastiness in your signal. There are tons of filters, but there are four that we should talk about in the 30 seconds we have left. Uh, The main ones that you'll use are the low-pass filter, which is, if you have a signal, anything that's lower than the cutoff goes through. The reverse of that is the high-pass, anything above the cutoff goes through. Then we have the band-pass filter. You set a cutoff frequency, and then the Q controls how much to either side goes through. And then, of course, the opposite of that, the notch filter, which is the inversion. And using these basic filters and all the others, you can create any number of complex sounds. Nicely done. Nailed the time. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That's what I'm going for. Cool. Well, yeah, thanks, Ben, for doing that. I think you did a pretty good job. Paula, how do you you feel? Did you cover audio filters pretty well? (laughs) I feel satisfied, but two minutes. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yes, uh, next week, uh, Nate will be doing... uh, Fourier transforms into <laughs> something like that. Right. We'll see. <laughs> well, yeah. Thanks again, uh, Paul, and, and for joining us and bringing Ron in. It, yeah, it was a great conversation. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you, do you have uh, do you have any other uh, things coming up or other uh, events of yours or other people that you'd like to plug before we wrap up? Um. Yeah, just uh, there's a lot of good stuff going on. Obviously, the sort of mental real estate has been towards organiza- organizing Seamus. Um, yeah. And, and um, otherwise than that, uh, working on a few creative projects here and there um, and just uh, playing around. So, yeah. Well, wonderful. Well, keep up the good work. And thanks again so much for the great conversation. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So this, is, uh, this has been our first patch in episode of the new year. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, yeah. You can uh, sort. You can uh, support the show or uh, tune in to soundnotion.tv slash pi. That's where we'll have all the notes and information about the show, as well as links to view the. Or you can view the show in audio or video format right there, or you can subscribe in iTunes. Um, you can support the show by. Uh, <laughs> we've got a little Amazon affiliate link, uh, or for, uh, a little search thing, um, and you can. We accept donations of many formats on on the website. Um, But yeah, thanks again so much, and uh, we'll see you next month on Patch In. Cool. Cheers.